Welcome to part two of three, organic chemistry. This time we're going to be talking about drawing and naming. Again, this is just an intro. The electrons forming the bonds for the hydrocarbon molecule take up space. If a carbon atom is forming four bonds, it generally adopts a tetrahedral geometry, which is a triangular pyramid with the carbon atom in the center. The question arises, how to show this three-dimensional reality on a 2D piece of paper or perhaps a computer monitor. Many methods are used to show the orientation of the bonds. It is very difficult to represent the 3D nature of bonds on a 2D surface such as paper and computer screens. Scientists have come up with many different ways of showing a simple methane molecule. In this drawing you can see the two hydrogens are connected to the carbon by a solid line looking right here. See that's the solid line. That means this hydrogen, carbon, and hydrogen are in the same plane. So if I drew a plane, they would be on that plane. Well, what then about these two? A solid wedge is used to denote the atom is coming towards the viewer. The dashed lines are used to represent bonds pointing out of the plane away from the viewer. So looking up here, that's away from the viewer and this is toward the viewer. And this is the plane of the computer. In drawing hydrocarbons, it can be time consuming to keep writing out each carbon and each hydrogen individually. Depending on what you need to convey, you select the easiest method to display the chemical composition of your molecule. These are all examples showing the same molecule. The last, the skeletal method, is a shorthand notation used for representing hydrocarbons. In a skeletal structure, only the bonds between the carbon atom are represented. So only the bonds between carbon atoms are shown when you're talking about the skeletal structure method, which is the bottom one right there. Bonds to hydrogen atoms are not drawn. And by the way, carbon atoms themselves are not drawn, only the bonds between carbon and carbon, or carbon and chlorine, or whatever it is that you're um, attaching it to. In the case that the molecule contains just single bonds, these bonds are drawn in a zigzag fashion. A carbon atom is assumed to be at each bend and at the ends. See how it is? You've got a carbon, a carbon, and a carbon. It's similar to denoting a circle. I can write circle. Circle. I could write the text. Or I could draw a circle. Or I can say radius equals 2. Those are all different ways to show a circle. Depending on how I need for you to use the information, depends on which helps me decide which method that I will use to draw it. Because orientation is important. Here we have two different molecules. We have sugar and we have Splenda. Notice how close they are. The green on the sucrose shows you the difference between those. Yes, it's replacing OH with CL, but also the orientation is changed. Notice how this comes toward you. It's a solid wedge. What's what's the dash line mean again? It means it's going away from you. Small differences like these, uh, changing OH for CL or going just changing from toward the viewer to away from the viewer, the orientation, is enough to stop your body from breaking down the molecules for energy. Only the bonds between carbons are drawn for the skeletal structure method. These have been drawn in zigzag fashion for our example of butane. Note that there is no representation of hydrogens in the skeletal structure. Since in the absence of double or triple bonds, carbon makes four bonds total, the presence of hydrogens is implicit, meaning we don't have to specifically say the hydrogens exist. Whenever an insufficient number of bonds to a carbon atoms are specified in this structure, you assume the rest of the bonds are made to hydrogens. So hydrogen is used to fault unless told otherwise. For example, if the carbon atom only makes one explicit bond, so at this example, 
we see this carbon right here, it's only making one bond to this one. So where are the hydrogen? Well, there's three because remember it has four total electrons to make the bonds. So here's one and then it has three available. If they're not shown, which it wasn't, then you assume it's what? Good. You assume it's hydrogen. Now let's look at the ones in the middle. How many would that have? Well, it already has this one, one, two. There's four total, so it has two hydrogens. It doesn't have to draw it because we can do the math ourselves. Again, that's how it looks. Now let's talk about naming hydrocarbons. There are at least 10 million carbon-based compounds in existence with more being discovered and created each year. It's critical that there's a consistent naming scheme. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry has a task of keeping the rules for naming compounds. You take the longest chain and that's where the parent name of the molecule comes from. Remember, hydrocarbons can contain many branches. So pick the longest one and use the prefix from this chart or a chart similar to it to get its name. If branching is present, a numbering scheme gets applied to the molecule to help you specifically locate where the branching occurred. Think of it as the same as a house address. A house number gets applied by the government so that you won't get the wrong mail. We won't go into numbering here just to let you know numbers are applied to the bonds in the chain so that you can specifically name the compound. If the longest number of carbons directly bonded to each other is 8, then for example the prefix of oct would be used as the prefix to that hydrocarbon. The ending part, if the chain contains only single bonds, then the ending a and e would be appended to the name. Right there. Hence propane that's where the name comes from, propane, which is gas, famous gas. And methane, the simplest hydrocarbon around. See how it's A and E to match that. Because there is no double bond, there's only single bonds here. If the hydrocarbon chain contains double, as it might have some singles in there also, then the ending is switched from A and E to E and E. Ethane, which is a colorless, odorless gas, if you switch this so it had a double bond, now becomes ethene, a gas with a faint, sweet, and musty odor. Properties change as the bonds change. The melting point, the boiling point, odor, consistency, which is, you know, is a thin and runny or thick and gummy, and color are all examples of properties that we use to identify organic materials. The squiggly line means that there is more involved, but do you now recognize what the straight lines represent? This was copied from Wikipedia. See how chemists around the world use this method of naming this nomenclature as shorthand for communicating the chemical structure of hydrocarbons. What critical biological process is this? You recognize it? DNA base pairs. Go DNA. In summary, different methods for different uses. Depending on what you're use, you want your user to walk away with, that's the method that you're going to use. The solid wedge means that it's coming toward the user. The dashed line means it's going away from the viewer. Lines. If you have the lines, if you're using the skeletal structure method, it denotes a carbon-carbon bond. If it's other than carbon, it's going to be listed there what the atom is. If there is no line, then you're assuming it's hydrogen. Alkynes, single bonds only, but if it has double bond, we call an alkenes, double bonds, and it may have single bonds in there. Prefix is based on the longest chain, and there is so much more. I'm just trying to give a little intro here. The last video we're going to talk about is functional groups, especially important when you're talking about DNA-based pairs, amino acids. The I hope that you've enjoyed this and that it helps you with understanding a bit more about organic chemistry.